Welcome to the Rebuild SoCal Zone, discussing all things related to infrastructure, the construction industry, its workers, and its politics. I'm John Swatolsky, your host. We are doing something special today. I had the opportunity to appear on the Nation State of Play podcast, whose audience is Sacramento Insiders, with their host, Brian Miller. We had a great discussion and are going to replay that podcast for you now. So here it is. I hope you enjoy. The Nation State of Play podcast is produced by IBC Media in San Diego, California. Hi, and welcome to Nation State of Play. I'm your host, Brian Miller. On each episode of this podcast, we explore high-impact topics determining the future of our nation state. We've got a great guest. It's John Switalski with Rebuild SoCal. We're talking about an issue, actually a series of issues that are really top of mind, both in the debate in Washington, but in what's going on in California here in particular, and that is infrastructure and the supply chain. And John's group really focuses on what we can be doing in California, particularly in SoCal, to be improving infrastructure, which is a huge problem. And that has collided with the recent supply chain issues, which are backing everybody's lives up. So this conversation really gets sort of into the nitty gritty of what is going on, what what is maybe um, the some of the solutions that we can start to get to to alleviate the uh, the backups that we're seeing in the supply chain here in California, but also what some of the long term changes are that need to happen. So John's uh, John's been a great leader on this issue. I think it's a really great conversation. I appreciate you tuning in. John Swatowski coming up after this with Rebuild SoCal. American democracy is good, but we can make it better. The National Association of Nonpartisan Reformers includes organizations across the country who are working right now to build a better democracy by opening primaries, implementing safe, secure voting systems, reducing corruption, and increasing transparency. Listen to our weekly podcast, How to Win Friends and Save the Republic, to hear updates from the latest movements in the democracy reform space. Subscribe and learn more about us at nonpartisanreformers.org. Welcome back to the Nation State of Play podcast. Well, John, thanks so much for being on the show today. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for having me. Appreciate the time. Uh, would you mind just starting with an overview of your organization? I think you've got a really sort of unique group of members and how you've approached the infrastructure problem. So having the listeners kind of hear a little bit more about your founding, I think would be helpful. Yeah, th- thanks. We do occupy a unique space here in Southern California. We represent both uh, the construction industry and its unionized uh, workforce. So specifically, we uh, represent about 2,750 construction companies from the global footprint of Skanska to mom and pop uh, shops uh, throughout the region. And then we represent about 90,000 organized union workers. So they're represented by LAUNA or the Laborers Union, uh, Operating Engineers Local 12, uh, and then the Southwest, Southwest Regional Council of Carpenters. Uh, impressive group, a lot of members, and you guys have a lot on your plate. So the whole issue of infrastructure, I know, is one that maybe people don't always have top of mind in normal times. And all of a sudden, it's become very top of mind to a lot of people as we've had huge supply chain disruptions. So I- I'm wondering if you, from your perspective, could kind of take us through where you think we are right now, both with the covid induced problems, but also with infrastructure generally in California. And then I want to focus on some of the specifics about what what can be done to tackle these challenges. Yeah, thanks. Let me kind of see if I can set this from a federal, state, and local perspective and then dig dig into the challenges you you just highlighted there. So, of course, we are supportive of the uh, $1 trillion bipartisan infrastructure package that has been passed in the Senate and that the the president um, fully supports. I mean, anything out of Congress that's bipartisan nowadays is is rare. And, um, you know, we very much support the passage of of that. Um, We also support increased... um, state investments, which has, uh, which has happened on transportation, um, has happened on broadband, broadband has happened in, in water in the recent 
a uh, couple budgets in, in, the, in Governor Newsom's administration. So we're very much supportive of that. And then from a local perspective, we are very supportive of uh, counties and localities raising revenue to further invest in infrastructure. And so it sounds like there's a lot going on in, in federal, state, local. Uh, but that being said, our infrastructure remains significantly underinvested in. I don't have to uh, point you and your listeners to uh, the constant traffic problems we have in, in Southern California, the lack of uh, mobility options that uh, we have um, even inside of the city of Los Angeles, but mo more notably, um, you know, in the Inland Empire um, and, and in Orange County. And there are some problems with moving the ball forward. I mean, you, you mentioned the supply chain issues, but we're also having a labor shortage. And the labor shortage in the construction industry is... Uh, is significant. And it's not just a problem of attracting those to go into uh, um, those jobs. It's not because they don't pay enough. It's not because uh, of uh, COVID unemployment benefits, uh, that, you know, that myth. What's keeping folks on, this, on the sideline in the labor shortage really is the affordability crisis in California. And so we see that in construction, we see that at the ports with the backlog of you know, 40 to 60 ships sitting out in the Pacific Ocean waiting to be, to be unloaded. And so um, that's something I think is, is the issue of affordability and, and, and the cost of housing is something that really is a deterrent um, to in attracting, um, in attracting a, uh, a steady labor force here in Southern California and, and likely throughout the state. So I want, I want to unpack that a little bit because because obviously this labor shortage thing is affecting a, a ton of different industries and um, it, there's some different perspectives out there for sure. But but your point is that these workers are not even here in California because of the lack of housing and just the affordability generally. So we just we just simply don't have that labor pool to draw on. As a general statement, that that's um, certainly the case. So. Um, you know, we talk about the, the exodus of Californians and it's often overstated and the state really hasn't seen um, on a whole a decrease in population. But recent reports and studies have seen that what is happening is that there is a significant migration of uh, individuals without college degrees. And those with college degrees you see an in inflow of. And so the, um, the policies of California uh, and the lack of um, uh, the ability to build housing, to build infrastructure over decades really has hollowed out. Uh, the working class is, is taking a detrimental um, impact on the, um, on the middle class. And really it's, um, it's steering towards more uh, high income uh, earners, knowledge-based uh, employers, and and that's problematic for uh, an industry that, um, for a state that needs infrastructure, a state that needs to invest in disadvantaged communities significantly, and a state that needs so much housing. Um, and so, you know, that's the real equity battle in my view. And I know that your listeners primarily are based in the capital in Sacramento and equity is, is bandied about um, quite often as a priority of state lawmakers and the administration. But in, inequity is wrought by the, the inability to build housing, to invest in infrastructure. And that is a policy regime that we've, we've seen in California Despite Governor Brown's best efforts, um, it's it funding uh, through SB1 and, and the subsequent uh, effort to defeat Proposition 6, the affordability crisis continues and, and is only getting worse in my view. So how did COVID impact these issues from your perspective? 
Well, thankfully, uh, you know, uh, right away, construction was deemed as um, essential work back in the spring of 2020. So that was um, that was a very critical move by by the governor's administration, and we advocated for that very much. So, so, uh, appreciate his support. Um, so there, there is um, been seen an advancement of projects, um, but the overall impact I think is is more um, on the margins. It, it is the backlog in um, the raw materials, um, in um, permitting uh, projects seems to have slowed, though that process is um, significantly um, slow as it is. So um, COVID um, has affected it more on the margins than wholesale. So part of the reason I ask is, I mean, it, it, it doesn't feel like, and I could be totally wrong about this in memory, but that we had the level of labor shortages as we did, as we, the ones that we do now before COVID. Is that not a fair assessment? Uh, I mean, what is, what is the, what did the sort of numbers bear out on this? Well, our, well, it's, um, it's a mixed bag. So we project that in 2021, our labor hours will increase, uh, have been increased 9%. Um, from 2020. And so that's, um, I think, more of a function of money moving through uh, the system. There has been a lot of, um, you know, federal investment and state in investment. Um, but because the labor hours are up, doesn't mean that there isn't um, a labor shortage for the projects that can be worked on or the projects that can't, the timeline can be, be condensed. Um, uh, you know, as you know, it it not only takes a long time to permit a project, it takes an awful long time to build projects. Uh, and so um, I'm not sure that the labor shortage, um, uh, you know, from, tw from 19 to 20 to 21 um, really has seen um, a significant change because of, of, of COVID. It's more of a labor shortage from the perspective of what uh, you know, what's in the pipeline, what could be uh, completed um, given uh, the amount of work that needs to be done. So you mentioned there's a federal role, there's a state role, there, there's a local role. What are you most focused on at the moment? Yeah, the legislature's on, on uh, their, their short recess for the year. Um, obviously there's a lot of stake in this federal legislation. I imagine that's occupying a lot of your attention. It is, but it is also supporting uh, lo uh, localities and metro and uh, MPOs in their planning process and making sure that we're not snuffing out um, hot housing and giving more uh, ammunition to to litigants who uh, you know are either with the uh, you know well-heeled environmental lobby or with the very powerful kind of NIMBY movement. Um, so we're involved uh, locally. Um, federally, of course, we're, we're engaged, um, but there are larger forces um, at play with the human infrastructure reconciliation package. Um, in terms of state policy, what we're very concerned about is, is two, I think, policy items that are in the bowels of, of bureaucracy um, in Sacramento. Uh, first, there's, uh, there's an issue of vehicle miles traveled, right? So as we move to from gas powered uh, vehicles to electric vehicles, we need to square um, how roads and bridges are paid for. And so our organization um, very much supports, a, you know, a, a vehicle miles traveled and a, a, in a, a switch to a real uh, true user um, fee and tax for that. We think that that's going to be more sustainable uh, over time as we look decades out. But what we're concerned with is the way the governor's uh, administration interprets vehicle miles traveled as it relates to CEQA mitigation it, when um, looking to advance projects. Um, so we have um, 
you know, we are under capacity now in, in our freeways and, and roadways throughout Southern California. We clearly have uh, not enough housing um, for, uh, for residents here. And um, we're concerned that vehicle miles traveled can be, can be and will be used to um, not approve transportation projects, to uh, skinny down the scope of uh, transportation projects, and again, be allowed to uh, be used as ammunition against any housing projects, even infill projects. And um, so we, we're watching that very closely. Um, the other one is managing stormwater uh, as it relates to construction. Uh, you know, as you can imagine, this, uh, the state of California has more um, regulations than any other state in the country when it, when it is managing stormwater runoff. And we are concerned that these regulations, these new potential regulations will put such a, a significant cost um, to mitigate th that um, the, the components of stormwater runoff uh, that it's either gonna cease uh, uh, building during the rainy months or again, it's just gonna add so much cost to building that we again are in this uh, spiral of uncontrolled uh, affordability issues. So the, the VMT issue has come up in a few recent um, episodes, actually, we've had a lot of people who've, who've rightly raised the red flag on this. Um, but for listeners who maybe didn't hear some of those prior episodes, can you do a little one-on-one for us? Like what agency has this, how this, how this is a creature of CEQA, what the, what the right reform is here that we're, that you're speaking? Yeah. So I think, so the legislature has, um, I, I want to believe a couple occasions, approved and, and reauthorized a pilot project. And, and this is essentially to um, pilot the charging, um, the user of a ro roadway or how much they drive based on how many miles they drive. So you get, it's, you get charged uh, a monetary fee, one unit per one mile uh, traveled. Um, which is different than a, a gas tax because some um, vehicles burn less gas per mile than more gas per mile, though you pay a flat uh, percentage of uh, each gallon that you, you purchase and then subsequently use. And so that's the, that's the 101. I mean, so the, the issue about sequel mitigation is, is, is that the overarching policy um, implementation or belief is that we need to, in the face of uh, climate change, reduce the amount of vehicle miles traveled. Well, in theory, you know, there perhaps isn't anything wrong with that. But the concern with VMT is that when, er when uh, suburban and rural areas are treated like urban areas, perhaps in San Francisco, mobility is not an issue. But in the counties of San Bernardino in Riverside, there are no mobility options. And so what VMT becomes is not just a vehicle miles traveled mitigation or trying to achieve less greenhouse gas, gas emissions. It becomes a land use plan. It, it becomes so expensive or the traffic becomes so, so difficult to, to manage that you prevent folks from moving to desirable communities, at least how they define desirable communities. And so it becomes almost centralized planning, prioritizing urban cores rather than suburban or rural communities. And so our major concern is that VMT mitigation is treated as a one size fits all um, and as centralized land use planning rather than really aimed at what it should be is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So what, what agency holds this, uh, this debate right now? ELSTA, I believe. Okay. And of course they're working with Caltrans and the, uh, and, and the office of planning in the governor's office. Um, I think that's the, the, the three headed, um, 
policy apparatus. So, uh, you know, I, I war reform has sort of been the third rail covering in politics for, for a long time. Um, I, I wonder where you are on, do we need legislation to actually start rethinking some of the elements of CEQA, given how it's been interpreted by the agencies, given how it's been interpreted by the courts? Do, do you think the law can function the way it is? I rhetorically just respond in saying, is the law functioning currently? Um, in some respects, I think it is. In some respects, I, I think it's not. Um, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not in a position where I, I can op opine on on CEQA. I don't have um, uh, enough uh, policy history with it, and I'm not up to speed with the you know the decades of uh, interpretations by the courts. Um, here, here's what we support. We support investment in infrastructure and the advancement of building out our transportation infrastructure, our water infrastructure. And we support doing that with skilled and trained labor. Um, there are disadvantaged communities throughout the state that lack clean drinking water. We invest billions and billions of dollars into programs near and far throughout California. Um, but there needs to be, in our view, a prioritization over clean water, dr clean drinking water um, more than almost any other policy priority. It's a, in our view, it's a human right. Let me just tell you about a recent experience um, that we had advocating for the city of Needles, which is in the Mojave Desert on the Colorado uh, River um, near the Arizona uh, border, in Nevada border. The city of Needles was forced by state regulators to close two of their three wells um, and had a, uh, and one very old well that um, only had about 12 hours of redundant uh, of um, backup uh, capability. So if the well went out, there was only about 12 hours of drinking water available for 4,500 residents of the city of Needles. The legislature approved uh, funding for emergency uh, well repair. And let me just quote emergency in that. And it's done through, by the, uh, through the State Water Resources Board, and it's called the SAFER program. Um, well, to apply for a loan it require, uh, or uh, funding for this, it requires um, engineers, it requires, uh, requires attorneys, and it requires grant writers to meet the demands of the State Water Resources Board, all of which the City of Needles um, can't afford and do not have the in-house um, expertise in. So my organization stepped up and provided those, those resources. So you have a nonprofit funding, uh, helping fund a municipal government to engage with a state government. So just um, see if that, uh, how much the sense that the, makes. the chain of command is broken down, but, uh, right. but thanks for stepping up. And, and we went on an advocacy campaign to get the State Water Resources Board to A, reply to us, to, to the city, B, to, to fund this so that if their water well went down, these folks would have, have clean water. This damn near took an act of Congress. We were fortunate enough to get a, uh, a front page article in the LA Times which got the attention of Senator Feinstein, who had to call the governor's administration, write a letter to the State Re Water Resources Board. Now, after that uh, article, there were, um, um, you know, elected officials who were very responsive and very sympathetic and, and, and did work to, um, to, to speed this along. And we got it sped along, but otherwise this would have taken two years to get this approved, not even including the, the construction costs. So when we say that you know, disadvantaged communities need to be invested, <clears throat> invested in, we need significant reform in, in Sacramento when it comes to doling out these funds. Um, it should never take two years and a letter from, from a U, our senior US Senator 
to get a government agency to come to the aid of a municipality um, when the funding is um, was just was approved just weeks weeks prior by the legislature, and so we need to rethink uh, the way that disadvantaged communities are dealt with in the state, and we need to prioritize, especially when it comes to wa- clean drinking water. Um, you know, by by some accounts, there are there there are almost a thousand communities who lack. Uh, who lack the appropriate amount of um, drinking water infrastructure to provide that redundancy so that um, folks aren't, um, you know, having to use bottled water as if, you know, we're living in a third world country. And, and that's, that's the, one of the focus points of our advocacy. Uh, it, yeah, it's an amazing story. I actually think it's a great place to wrap with a really vivid illustration of kind of what's what's going on here. Um, you've laid out some some really long term challenges. Uh, it's it certainly is is a dangerous, dire situation in a lot of ways now. And as you can see from that story, we have no time to waste. So, John, thanks for what your organization's doing. If people want to find more out about your group, your work, your partnership, where can they go online? RebuildSoCal.org. Great. Uh, John, well, thanks for the time. Thanks for being on the show today. And uh, we, we hope all those cap- capital insiders are, are listening to the important, uh, important work ahead on this topic. Thank you. The Rebuild SoCal Zone is Southern California's only construction-based podcast that color- covers all things infrastructure and construction related. We discuss up and coming construction trends and infrastructure projects in Southern California that will affect your roads, drinking water and your overall quality of life. Our goal is to educate the public on the continued need for infrastructure funding and highlight those key projects. To hear our latest episodes, visit our website at rebuildsocal.org and at the top you'll find our podcast or subscribe wherever you listen.